Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar, Listen Up, Let's Make Noise About Hearing, the second webinar in our Listen Up series brought to you by BOHS and the UK Hearing Conservation Association. After the presentations today, we'll be doing a Q&A session like uh, the previous webinar. So if you have any questions, please submit them and we'll get through as many at the end as we can. Any that we don't get round to due to time constraints, we will throw the questions to our panelists to answer and we'll distribute the whole Q&A via email, along with a recording of today's webinar. Um, and then uh, if you have any other further questions, feel free to email myself, BHS, or any of the emails that you see at the end of the presentation today. So that's all from me, and I will pass you over to Alex Wilson to begin. Hello, everyone. Uh, so we're just going to do a little bit of a quick intro to the series. Um, so thank you, Lee, for um, for the official uh, webinar intro. So yeah, the UKHCA, UK Hearing Conservation Association. Um, it's uh, we, we're really pleased to be able to uh, get involved with the BOHS and offer this series of webinars. And and we were um, over the moon with the um, the response to the first one. So we hope that you uh, you find this. Uh, this webinar interesting also and um, yeah the UK Hearing Conservation is a very new association but one that um, we are pleased to say is gathering speed and, and one that is passionate about um, protecting people's uh, hearing and preserving and promoting hearing health so that's our vision and we uh, we try and focus and, and support um, different areas and different groups and these webinar series are really focusing on the at work environment. Um, however, uh, as you can see there, we also um, um, support and provide guidance and get involved in leisure, uh, young people's education, and also the music and entertainment uh, sectors as well. And uh, it was something that we were hoping to get involved in a lot more this year, but um, unfortunately, because of the current situation we find ourselves in, that's kind of been put on hold a bit. But um, yeah, we are passionate about what we do and uh, it's something that um, uh, yeah we, we hope you guys are too so why is noise a problem um, if you're on this webinar series you probably know why it's a problem anyway but um, exposure to, to high noise can cause debilitating impacts and um, it's something that in the UK alone we um, the statistics say that over 20,000 people have some kind of work related hearing problem um, so that was taken from the, the latest statistics from the UK HSE. Um, all these problems aside, they are generally fully preventable. And that's one of the biggest things that we, we often um, forget sometimes with regards to noise induced uh, hearing problems is that um, it's one of the uh, most preventable kind of um, occupational ill health kind of areas compared to some of the others. So it's definitely something that we need to kind of continue to to stress this and that, again that's one of the aims of providing information from the from the association and um, yeah uh, th th this slide kind of often introduces this um, what is noise and, and, and often I, I got taught before sound is a good thing and noise is the bad thing so it's unwanted sound and um, we often again we relate noise or, or good noise sounds to, to lots of real positive things in our lives um, but it does have um, that unwanted um, aspect to it where it can cause us damage as well which is something we need to take, um, take care of um, but also we don't want the general situation to also isolate us as people and the next slide um, is just very interesting when it comes to the impact of new technologies that we've had in terms of uh, availability, especially to the younger populations, where you can just see here in terms of um, a, a weekly kind of exposure chart, some of the um, kind of recommended timescales that you should be thinking about with regards to listening to music at certain, um, certain noise levels there. And, and as you can see, it, it doesn't take long to, um, to give yourself some significant damage with regards to um listening to even personal music and stuff so hence why we've got those other kind of work streams within the association personal con consequences of um untreated uh, noise induced hearing loss though can be um quite impactful on anyone's life and, and those these four sections here just show that it covers the kind of a 
across the spectrum in terms of our physical, mental health, relationships with other people, um, our general life, quality of life uh, as a whole, and also that the impact on our working life and, and our financial situations, especially if we're not able to work um, because of our debilitating kind of illnesses. So um, we need to get things right. We need to do it right. And um, yeah, we, ho we hope that this webinar series offers some of the tools to, to help you do that. Interesting information here with regards to attitudes and behaviours where noise uh, is sometimes not taken seriously. And um, there, is the, uh, there is consequences of, of kind of the loss uh, and the impact of hearing. And um, yeah, it's uh, again, it's, it's the other aspects here in terms of uh, dementia, memory loss, it's, um, it's something that can continue with us. And it's not just the general hearing side of things, but it's that psychosocial impact that also um, kind of comes with it, which, um, which we, don't, we don't want people to kind of impact. We don't want people to suffer. Um, but some of these, these aspects here is so severe hearing loss, five times more likely to develop dementia. So it's something that um, we've, we've, we've seen in different industries. And another stat kind of coming out from that is the number of fatal accidents on construction sites are because of the knock-on impacts of noise-induced hearing loss. So uh, definitely something which hopefully is, is helping set the scene for the need for us to, to, to push forwards with this. So today we've got hearing health surveillance and new ideas, fresh approaches in our series of, of webinars. Um, as Lee said, this is a, a joint webinar series with the UK Hearing Conservation Association and the BOHS with the Chartered Society of Worker Health Protection. So it's fantastic that we've been able to partner um, with the BOHS on this. And as you can see there, we've got three more webinars after today as well to complete the series. Um, so every two, uh, they happen every two weeks. So the next one's the 22nd of October, then the 5th of November and the 19th. Again, we've got different um, people um, that are uh, giving up their time from the, from the association to present on these topics. So again, some really interesting topics there um, moving forwards. I think the uh, reproduced sound in office and industrial environments is an interesting one. I think. So uh, yeah, lots of new topics there to um, to get your um, to get your ears on and get get sink your teeth into. Um, but yeah, today we've we've got the uh, the topic of of health surveillance and new ideas. So uh, just uh, as as a part of that, I'm going to introduce um, to you. We've got. Um, uh, two main speakers and a, and a, 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 a special uh, intro speaker from Claire as well, who you've probably met before. So Claire Forshaw is one of the founding members of the uh, UK Hearing Conservation Association. Um, she helped set this up. She was instrumental in setting up the first Listen Up conference when she was part of the HSC. And she's now an occupational hygienist working at Park Health. Um, we've, we've also got um, two other speakers. Um, in Tom Park and Rob Shepherd. So Tom is uh, an audiologist who's been involved in audiology for over 15 years. Um, he's been working with clients like the NHS over that time, and now he's the director of Workstream. Uh, so Tom's title today is going to be looking at innovate, innovating surveillance hearing tests. Uh, Rob Shepherd is a clinical audiologist. He specializes, he specializes in treatment of tinnitus and all types of hearing disorders. Um, but over the last 25 years, he's had a, a very uh, big interest in developing initiatives used to test and conserve audiometry health and prevent noise-induced hearing loss in uh, tinnitus and deafness. Um, he's had a lot of uh, special areas of interest, and one of the that took my uh, interest was um, motorsport. So he's worked with the FIA and commissioned research uh, on uh, noise exposure and hearing conservation in Formula One, which I'm, I'm sure was very, very interesting. So um, we've got some great experts on the um, on, on the uh, on the webinar today. Uh, just to finish off, Rob's title is going to uh, is, is focusing on Autoacoustic Commission Health Surveillance and Hearing Conservation Association. So um, just before I hand over, um, if you want more information. Uh, as Lee said, there's going to be information uh, available at the end of the webinar. Um, this is the UK Hearing Conservation Association's 
um, contact information. Um, we'd love for you to get involved in this journey with us. Um, the hashtag love to hear is something that we've tried to kind of take hold of and use as part of our social media. So again, please get involved. Please sign up to the newsletter. Any inquiries, we'd love to hear from them. So that's the uh, that's end of the intro from me. Um, I want to hand over now to our uh, esteemed speakers and I, I wish you all a great webinar and hope you find it interesting. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Just going to pass over to yourself, Claire, to begin your slides. We just share your screen. Thank you. I'll show my screen and hopefully it'll pick the right one. Let me know if it comes up. There we go. We've got it as soon as it falls. How are we doing? There we go. Over to you. Excellent. Okay. Great. So you can all hear me, hopefully. Uh, yeah, I can't help myself, can I? I've got to have something to say in these things. I promise to shut up for the rest of them. Um, really, just because I've got a really kind of um, historic involvement in health surveillance uh, and particularly uh, noise health surveillance um, uh, for my sins and, and actually hold my hands up guilty as charged. I wrote the guidance to for health surveillance in the current L108. Um, and I know there are um, significant issues or since definite issues with with the guidance uh, which I'll kind of touch on in this very short kind of background to um, noise health surveillance. Yeah so I've been involved in the in noise health surveillance but also interpreting um, health surveillance requirements for COSH, um, hand eye vibration and musculoskeletal um, disorders. Um, so I understand what health surveillance is, what it's intended to be um, from a legislative perspective um, and I also understand and appreciate that that's not always understood um, across the piece. So just a bit of a reminder really, what is health surveillance and why do we do it? Or what should it be, I should say. Um, so health surveillance is about identifying early indicators of ill health in order to put in corrective actions to protect people. So it's definitely part of our risk management process, even though in most circumstances it tends to sit somewhere separate, completely isolated from our risk management program, um, in a box somewhere, if you're doing health surveillance properly, uh, or audio health surveillance properly. Um, it, it's, it's done in isolation, but it shouldn't be. It's also done uh, as a blanket test or a nice to have test for people, but it shouldn't be. It is part of our risk management. It should be based on risk, which means that people are exposed to potentially hazardous noise or other hazardous exposures are targeted for health surveillance, um, specifically involved in the programme in order to check um, that their exposures continue to be um, managed and those people um, are protected. So it's part of a system for checking health as part of our risk management. Uh, and in that process, we have to um, look at the results, look at the outcomes in an anonymized way to feed back into our process um, in order to identify where further actions or checks need to be done. And it is a legal requirement. It's not a nice to have, it's not a health check, it's not a hearing check, it's part of our risk management process. And the idea is that it has this role in protecting health. Um, you might want to think of it as a as a kind of, you know, in the hierarchy of control, which um, as many of us as hygienists probably um, logged into this call, think of um, the kind of administrative controls. Um, so part of that, uh, a final check, a bit like our exposure monitoring approach. We do things to check um, exposures. We do things to check our controls on maintaining the exposures. Similarly, health surveillance is there to do that check on people's health so that nothing's failing. Uh, that final check to pick up that people aren't actually um, taking in these exposures and suffering ill health and that idea of finding things early. Um, but it does have a role in picking out people who might be more vulnerable. So, so we look at it, I certainly look at it as a grouped approach. So looking at a population, a similarly exposed group, or however you want to describe it. Um, but it can also pick up individual issues, which we're not going to throw out and ignore. Uh, if people are particularly vulnerable or susceptible, the process allows us to pick those people up uh, and refer them for, for particular help that they might need. Um, and for me, health surveillance, the most 
for me, the most important thing about it is it's a one-on-one -on -one opportunity that you just you just might not get at any other time for, for an independent person often or somebody independent within the business to sit down, talk to the individual about their hearing with some evidence about how their hearing is, um, it, it's their hearing status is, um, and coach them, advise them with, with, with that kind of real opportunity to uh, influence them to take things seriously. So that's how I see health surveillance as well as how the law sees health surveillance. And for noise, um, currently our guidance talks about um, undertaking pure tone, pure tone audiometry. So there are, as I say, there's limitations in the guidance and there's potentially limitations of how we do health surveillance at the moment, which is what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of pleased to introduce uh, Tom and Rob today to talk about different ways and innovative ways we can we can undertake these tests and make sure they get done. For me, sometimes it's if it's not done properly, what we're doing is we're detecting hearing at a level where it's irreversibly um, harmed and damaged um, and maybe at a level where it's kind of impacting on people's quality of life. Um, so it's not serving the purpose really of, of being this early intervener, this early indicator, um, so we can stop that irreversible harm happening. That means it's probably been uh, exposure over a, quite a long time, 10, 20 years maybe, before we're picking any actual harm up while these exposures have been happening. Makes it really difficult then to relate um, exposure results today with health outcomes today. Um, if it's again, if it's done properly, there are particular test conditions to um, comply with to get good quality results. And Tom might be able to introduce um, some different ways of doing that and different um, ways to get a, a test result. Um, and you need the cooperation of the person. And, and with all these kind of uh, cases against employers, um, you know, you don't want anyone trying to cheat or or, or also um, being a bit baffled by how to comply with the test um, conditions and, and, and give a good response uh, to the test itself. We did some research uh, when I was back at HSC and to look at what's going on at the moment and to get some uh, occupational health providers and people doing noise health surveillance feedback from them, um, from their views of, of how this system's working. Um, thinking about noise compared to um, for example, hand-arm vibration health surveillance. We have very kind of strict rules about what competence and what level of qualification uh, an occupational health provider needs for um, undertaking HAVS health surveillance. We're, we're quite flimsy, I would say, on the noise side. We sort of say have a bit of training. Your BSA approved, that's British Society of Audiology approved, is recommended, but on the job trainer will probably do. Um, probably not as tight on our competence requirements uh, in the guidance, uh, who oversees the programme, uh, making sure that's established. Um, again, test environment, there's quite a lot of practice out there where people aren't using um, soundproof booths, so potentially the test environment is affecting the results. A lot of reliance on automated testing, so you, you do the test, the computer tells you the results, churns out, and, and people relying on that and not using professional judgment to actually look at the individual's audiogram trace. Um, subsequently went to retest and check some of those results and comparing results seems to be forgotten about. And there are concerns with the categorization scheme, which I've had discussions with people about, and I'm happy to have ongoing discussions about that, uh, where it comes from, and the fact that there seems to be some evidence that a lot of people are falling into the um, category one, um, you know, that the hearing loss is fine, kind of pass, um, but are reporting problems with the hearing. And so are actually suffering um, some hearing impact, but not being picked up by the categorization scheme, which again is another concern. Uh, we're potentially missing a trick to um, feedback to the risk management program, but also provide those individuals with the health support that they need. That's really um, all I wanted to kind of do as a kind of background to why health surveillance is of, of concern. Um, so I'll hand over to Tom and to let him talk about some innovation um, and new uh, ways to engage people with noise health surveillance and get them, get them doing it. Thank you, Claire. I will pass you over to Tom now. Brilliant, thanks Claire. Let me just uh, see if I can get this in the right place first. Uh, show my screen. 
Okay, so um, brilliant. Thank you for that. And um, uh, thank you, Alex, for uh, giving me a qualification I didn't know I had. So I have been in supplying audiology for well, between 15 and 20 years, but I'm not an audiologist. So um, please don't think I've managed to uh, escape things being uh, 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 going through exams and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah, that was that was nearly a, a very uh, lucky happening. So I'm just going to cl clatter through some bits and pieces today um, and tell you what where we are and what we found and try and then reference to where I think the industry is going and and where perhaps we will start seeing some some, some further innovations from what we've got and, and some of the slides that I'm going to go through there are, are just written down there on the on the contents. But yeah, so where I came from is I used to be supply side into the NHS private audiology and personally I became fairly frustrated with the amount of research and amount of effort going into hearing aids and addressing hearing problems after the fact and um, I felt that there perhaps wasn't enough innovation at the front end of things and uh, I um, found the the uh, technology behind WorkScreen with my business partner and felt that actually we had something that we could go forward here. So here's a little bit of a story of it. So as Claire's been saying, surveillance needs to be done, you know, whether it's whether it's by law or where it's the moral thing to do or, or, or actually the thing that I get quite upset about is the whole point about managing risk. I mean, Annex touched on this, that um, you know, here, when you look at the, the stats in terms of fatalities and where it actually, you know, situational awareness um, and, and, and thereby hearing, which has a, you know, a non line of sight element, you know, how that could have an impact on, on, the, on the fatalities. You know, I think this is huge. And if you haven't tested someone's hearing, if you don't know how well they can hear, then you don't know what risk they are subjected to or indeed you're subjecting your organization to. So you're you're not even protecting the company correctly. So, you know, uh, a rule of thumb that we say to people is you, if you are habitually expecting your team to be wearing hearing protection, you give them earmuffs, um, then on their own, they're not enough. You need to be putting them on a surveillance. And, and that's kind of where we, where we come from. Um, that said, we know that compliance is, is notoriously poor. Um, perhaps poor is too strong a word, but it's, it's not universally good. And looking behind that, we found there are seven reasons. Ish, you might find more, uh, but I hope some of these resonate. Uh, clearly, one of the issues at the moment is C19. Um, uh, I've got other things going on. I've got more important things going on, arguably, or, or actually I'm, I'm not allowed to bring other people off site, on site to do surveillance and the whole thing and sort of come to a grinding halt or I'm doing it by paper. Um, I've written some blogs about that. You can't do paper tests forever, clearly, paper management. Um, then then the things like the Sisyphus conundrum, I'm just doing so much surveillance that actually people fall through the net and they do. And it's the same people who fall through the net every time. But I'm so busy, I don't get back to doing it. Um, other people and some of our larger organisations have this bizarre situation where they have a very well established surveillance and an occupational health programme. But they've got little teams and offshoots and people working from home. And you know what? It's very difficult to do them. So suddenly you have some HR manager or someone who's demanding that a member of staff uh, is put through a surveillance program um, and they need it done tomorrow. But they happen to be based on a hill um, in Scotland and you've got to do that within your budget. Uh, and it's very difficult to provide surveillance for that person when they're at their office or at home, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, these things, these things happen and that's a big, big issue that we find. Legality issue, someone's gone on site, they've done a, no they've done a noise assessment on site, what do I do next? That's a very classic small company issue. The insurer said you need to do surveillance and they don't know what to do and they come to us. Uh, piggy bank problem, classic one, just uh, budget. You, you, people looking for, to, to understand how to do something in a way and present the lowest financial impact to their organization. And um, the one that we have from practitioners, and, and this might be interesting um, from practitioners and, and um, operations managers and people like that, is um, if you are an OH provider and you've turned up on site, it is we have non um 
uh, did not arrive rates, DNA rates, quoted of up to 50%. So not only are you providing something, but actually the company is organizing, operating against itself and people aren't turning up. And it's very difficult to provide a surveillance system if, if the operations team aren't supporting the, the uh, occupational health team and making their staff available. But this happens time and time again. Uh, and it is obviously a productivity issue, it's an expense issue, and it's a healthcare issue. And on the flip of that, small companies tend to find that actually they find it difficult for someone uh, to give them a quote that they find acceptable because the minimum call-out fee is is um, is, is pretty is, is pretty punchy. So that's some of the things behind what we do and why we do it and why we felt that there's a lot of great work going out there, but it's not quite right for the way we do business today for a lot of organisations. And I'll think on where we're going to go later as well in a minute. However, taking what we know and thinking about the solution, you know, where do we start? Could we start with a different technology? What technology were we going to look at? Um, and we don't have resources to invent the wheel. I don't believe we did. And people have often said, audiometry is the gold standard. Hmm, okay, that's a big statement. But, you know, when we took, looked at the, when we, for what we're doing in terms of a screening process, in terms of surveillance or audiometry, when we were looking at what is the technology, audiometry works for us. And I think it is, there are many reasons why it is the technology that works. And, you know, here they are, as far as we can see them. It's established, it's been going since, you know, either last century or after the Second World War, depending on how you look at it. It's validated, it's established, it's well understood, it's intuitive. Here is a, mocked up audiogram but this is a work screen audiogram and it's intuitive with not much with not much explanation you can communicate to most people what their hearing looks like and how and why it might be different from what what it should be and and what you're trying to explain to them it's it's real world it is about the beeps that they cannot cannot hear so that is really that is reasonably easy to communicate with that people it's intuitive and i really love that about audiometry when we're trying to triage you know people with no issues away from the people who may need help you know we think that audiology still is audiometry still is the way to go we've got historical data sets and patterns so we can start interpreting it and start putting in places like um as claire's been saying that the, the policies around noise induced hearing loss we can look for those patterns and use them as benchmarks and meanwhile the technology is accessible okay it, 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 you know, changing all the time, but whether you're talking about this or audiometers, you know, traditional audiometers, it is a known quantity and they're comparable and they're standardized and the techniques are established. So we know what we're doing. We should be able to produce a set of quantitative data, um, you know, from a, from a subjective response, we're banging out some quantitative data and we can, we can compare that, we can compare it over time and we can use that to support training and education again because of this intuitive thing so that is where we start of, um, and i really think for what we're doing i i think that there is uh audiometry uh, has a, a lot to offer and that is why we we start from where we are and you know so we've got some goals here. What we're trying to do is we're trying to produce data. The interpretation of the data, as we said, you know, that is where the care comes in. But at the end of the day, gathering data, we use machines to gather data around the world for many different things. And that is what we're trying to gather that data. We're trying to accessible, be flexible, uh, provide value for money. And these days, you know, it's got to be done consistently. It's got to be done reliably. Um, and, and these days, of course, um, in the world of COVID, we've got to somehow fit it in the whole COVID thing. So that's the sort of the, the, the world that we were trying to to pick up on it. and I think increasingly we're going to see this 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 moving forward so within that it's it's a technical problem and it's a process problem and that's how we came at this it's not just let's invent a bit of technology that does something it is a technical problem and a process problem so we, we call this slide Goldilocks and the three options and you know it comes down to making sure that you know how do we make hearing tests that can take closer to where it take place closer to where the staffs are at any time that's convenient and keep the costs low um but also maintain that quality so we've got to keep the clinical control high but we've got to for the real world get that maximize that flexibility so that we can capture every single person 
And so that's what we're trying to do. And, um, you, you know, this slide here about the, the on-site audiometry, everyone will know better than I do where that goes wrong. Mobile clinics have got their place, but clearly if you're a small organization, all you need to do a lot, there's a minimal call out fee associated with that. And you can, you can bet your, your bottom dollar that the day that your mobile clinic turns up is gonna be the day that someone's not available. Uh, you know, funerals or whatever, it happens, we're people. Uh, and offsite clinics, well, you know, that's got its own cost associated with it. So, uh, uh, and from, a, from an occupational health provider's perspective, wouldn't it be nice if we had another pair of hands <coughs> to do some of the donkey work for us? So those are the challenges, and of course, that's where we feel it's a classic two by two matrix. We've engaged with the big disruptor. We've engaged with mobile technology. We've engaged them with um, we can then look at um, doing multiple tests on the same side upscale. Typically, you wouldn't want to do it in the same room uh, before anyone shouts. But uh, so we, we've mocked that, that picture up. But you can appreciate we can add scale. We can add flexibility there. And this is by leveraging the same technology that is disrupting every other um, uh, every other uh, business on the planet, essentially. So there we have. That said, it takes more than that. You know, you do have your patient at the beginning of it, but we need an on-site coordinator and we provide them with the training and support. They've got to know what they're doing. They've got to be competent. If they're not competent, we don't talk to them because they can't do what they need to do. But we do need that individual there. We do have an audiologist on Overwatch who is looking at the report, who is providing the referrals, and as Claire says, who needs to look at it and make that call. Do we send people back through? Yes, we do a lot. We do send people back through. If we don't like what we see, we send them back through. And it's easy enough to do that. Um, and, and then we will make a call on it and have a look at it. And sometimes we speak to the coordinator and sometimes we speak to the health and safety manager just to see a little bit what's going on. But in the background to this, we've got the database and the cloud and it's doing the number crunching and it's making sure that um, we, we use the cloud, of course, because for GDPR reasons, you could put it on the handset. Um, but we we use the cloud and we use it so therefore we we have is we have an audit trail you know it's a it's an independent audit trail we know what is going on the checks are done um we do a verification check at the end of everything that is done each time every time and it is part of the process it means that every test is done to the same process um and whether it's the hundredth test of a day or the first test in the day you are going to get the same processes followed, which means it's comparable data and we're getting good data. And that's what we're trying to do. It's about consistent, high quality data. Um, and some of the other things that are nice, of course, is that the on-site coordinator is known to the member of staff uh, because the coordinator is part of your organization. They can manage the process that works for their organization because we are trying to make sure that this works for the organization. So that's, I think, key to where this is. It's not just a technology, it is a full system. And, and essentially, this is the way it looks. It's a simple online system for us. Uh, we, say, it's nice for example, we can go anywhere there's a signal, a uh, mobile phone or, or, um, or Wi-Fi. Uh, the guy on the bottom left, there's minimal training involved because, frankly, everyone can use a tablet or a phone these days. Guy down the bottom left, he was pretty educationally challenged uh, and my 10 year old son uh, tests himself and I've got a quote somewhere which I still haven't put on the internet. It is very easy to use because that's the way it should be, which means we've got safe, no contact, flexible testing, instant reporting, they know what's going on, there's big buy-in from the patient because they're part of their own process. It's not being done to them, they are doing it. And again, I think that is something that's really happening. You know, People engaging with their own healthcare is something that happens around the world. So I think that's, I'm really proud that that's something we're part of that engagement and learning. So next, um, I would like to see, going back to the thing, uh, hearing test induction, more noise awareness, particularly in hospitality. I know they're having a dreadful time now, particularly in hospitality, the coffee shops, you know, uh, logistics, um, truckers, drivers, things like that, uh, and offices. So many people are wearing earphones in the offices now, which Alex was talking about earlier. Full AI, could you do it? Technically, yes. Um, but of course, we then need to make sure it's done right. We need to make sure the meaning's there and we capture the people in the right way. 
uh, improve accessibility that's form factor people come up with different versions of, of what we do in different ways and we've got to stay ahead of that game for sure um, I think we've, we've, we've really started something moving um, and of course there is the option then to add on other technologies that, that complement um, audiology so with that um, points to remember it's, hearing surveillance is still it's more important Alex picks up on that one um, it, it's not what we're doing but the way we are doing it we're just trying to make it more accessible that's what we're about everyone who needs a hearing test should get one that's what we think um, whatever you think about work screen or me or uncle tom coblin or e-health and telehealth is here it, it's happening like every other industry it's here so engage with it use it to our best advantages and within that flexibility is key that's what we're maximizing on every single client of ours is different has something slightly different and we try and work with them that's what we try and do um, and quality is, is about modern technology it's not just about a fancy app we really try and, and work with that one and i hope those are things that are just will, will help take us forward and i'm really pleased to be part of the uk hca because i think it's an important job to be done and with that i'll hand over Excellent, thank you, Tom. I will uh, pass the baton over to our final presenter, Rob, who should be able to share his screen at the moment. Bear me a second. Tell me when I'm up and running. There we go. If you just um, pull the presentation back up, you just had it there a moment ago. Is it All right, bear a second. Is it up now? Not yet. I don't know if it's if it if it's a two screen setup if it's on a on a different. Uh, bear with me, sorry. Yeah, no, just right. get another. Uh... We saw it for a split second, a blink of an eye. Okay, bear with me. Are we up there now? There we go, yeah. If you just full screen that and then um, I can let you begin. There we go, perfect. I'll mute myself now. Over to you. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, thank you, Alex, for the intro. And uh, uh, Claire, thank you for the invitation to speak with everybody today. Um, so, for all those of you I haven't met before, uh, and further to Alex's introduction, my name is Rob. I'm a uh, clinical consultant. I'm a, a consultant audiologist. For more than 35 years now, I have enjoyed that role, which means that for a long, long, long time, I have uh, I've sat in hospitals, I've sat in clinics, and I have tested, I've assessed, I've diagnosed, or I've assisted with the diagnoses, and I have treated a large number of individuals with a, a wide range of auditory and vestibular conditions and as Alex said for, for more than 25 years in addition to my clinical duties I've specialized more in the uh, induced auditory disorders how we manage them how we assess them uh, uh, induced auditory disorders including hearing loss but also tinnitus hyperacusis other conditions and it was it was during my clinical work, just like Tom, I became very frustrated that uh, I don't think enough was being done for noise-induced conditions. And the traditional approach to assessing noise-induced disorders fell short of my objectives. It, it, it uh, limited my ability to care for those individuals and to treat their conditions. So that's when I started uh, in my research, sort of 94, 95, uh, no, sorry, 93, 94, I started. And ever since, as, as I'm sure Claire will, uh, will let you know, uh, I've championed the development and the implementation of alternative and complementary hearing conservation initiatives in occupational health. So over the years, I have provided occupational health services to various organizations and uh, individuals. And my own research, again, as, as Alex mentioned, was not only in industry, uh, but uh, with 
the FIA and Formula One, uh, and I help initiate one of their, their uh, early hearing conservation programs. Um, and uh, I, I've been a member of a number of national committees. Currently, I'm the audiologist of various organizations. And in recent times, I've been very much more involved and concerned with hearing loss and uh, problems with, with, with noise for musicians. And this year, on behalf of the uh, Healthy Conservatives Network, the Royal College of Music, and the British Association for Performing Arts, along with my colleague, Dr. Fanola Ryan, who's a, an occupational health physician, we've written guidance and recommendations on best practice hearing conservation programs for all UK musicians and uh, performers. So hopefully all that will, will demonstrate that I have a very keen interest in what Claire's Hearing Conservation Association is trying to achieve. So today I have been asked to uh, scratch the surface or, or touch upon, speak with you about photoacoustic emissions, OEEs, and uh, are they a complementary or alternative tests for hearing loss. And the first thing I'd like to say is that we're, we're discussing hearing loss, but I think that that focused viewpoint may be missing or underestimating the um, impact other auditory, common auditory conditions that can and do result from noise exposure have on the individual. Especially in the, in the early stages, people are often very dismissive or they're even unaware of a mild uh, noise-induced hearing loss. It won't have any devastating impact on their lives, but, but tinnitus, tinnitus is a, it's a very different animal. Uh, it can present in the very earliest stages of injury, its emergence can uh, be precipitated by one single exposure to hazardous noise levels. Um, and they, th those people may demonstrate perfectly normal audiometric. I would suggest that when, when we're talking about hearing conservation, we should uh, widen our attention, our consideration to include those other auditory, uh, auditory uh, aspects of health. So in order to understand what OEEs are and why we should exploit them in occupational health, I think we really need to quickly run through uh, anatomy and physiology and etiology around noise-induced injury. Let's just quickly scoot through all this. Basically, let's look at the inner ear. So basically the inner ear, as we all know, converts the, the uh, movement or the, the mechanical energy into electrical signals. They shoot them up the acoustic or eighth nerve to the brain where we interpret those changes in electrical signals as a sound. If we look at the hair cells in the cochlea, and I'm sure you all know about this, but let me just reiterate it. Uh, you can see along the top that there is one row of inner hair cells and three rows below of outer hair cells. Now, the inner hair cells, uh, I think, are far less impressive. You could consider them to be um, just sensory cells. They're the, they're, the, uh, they're the cells that send the signals up to the brain, so we interpret those sounds. The outer hair cells, they're much more uh, active. And when they're stimulated by an efferent signal that come down the, the auditory pathway, they can actually change their physical dimensions to uh, allow the cochlea to be more sensitive, more, more selective in the, in the signals it sends up to the brain. So for effective hearing of complex sounds such as of music or speech in background noise, you know, communications in a noisy factory, 
we rely on the unaffected performance of those outer hair cells to, uh, to increase the selectivity or enhance the performance of the cochlea. So if we're listening to simple sounds, such as pure tones, we're much less reliant on those outer hair cells. And our current understanding from a wealth of empirical evidence is that in humans, the first structures to be damaged by noise exposure are these outer hair cells in the cochlea. So uh, those outer hair cells will be irreparably damaged. And what normally happens is we have a sequential uh, way of the damage. The, the third row will be damaged, then the second row will be injured, and then the first row, and then eventually we'll get to the inner hair cells. So what's really important to remember from that is that it's the outer hair cells that are damaged first by exposure to ototoxic risk factors such as noise. And also we will lose a significant proportion of those outer hair cells long before we'll see any reduction in audiometric thresholds. So what are OEs? Uh, well, as we talked about the damage, we can scoot through that. But once again, it's the outer hair cells that are damaged, and that damage is irreversible. So, when we, uh, a natural byproduct or a phenomenon of uh, the performance of a healthy cochlea and those outer hair cells, is that when we stimulate those outer hair cells, as I mentioned, they will. They will contract, they will relax, they will change their physical dimensions. But a result of that is that a, a very small response is produced and it feeds in reverse back through the, through the uh, middle ear cavity, back through the eardrum. And using your right appropriate equipment, we can record that response as a very tiny, small sound. And those sounds are OEs or, or autoacoustic emissions. So we're, we're stimulating with a chosen stimuli and we're recording that response. And so we can measure effectively outer hair cell function. So OEs, autoacoustic emissions testing, is a tried and tested procedure. We've used it routinely in hospitals for 30 years. Primarily, we've used it as a screening test on neonates, uh, uh, newborn babies, um, but it doesn't test hearing. I mean, we've used it as a screening test for hearing loss, but it doesn't test hearing. What we're doing is, it, is we can only indicate the activity or, or the loss thereof of that one structure in the cochlea, the one first to be damaged by noise. So conveniently for us in occupational health, by utilizing this technique, we can monitor over time the performance of the very part of our ear that's damaged by exposure. It's a reliable, it's a repeatable test, it's objective, it's quick, it's non-invasive, and it's sensitive to the early changes in cochlear performance from exposure to those risk factors. So, why should we use this procedure as an occupational health surveillance tool when we've got audiometry, as, as Tom was explaining most eloquently, you know, we've, we've got effective methods of testing for hearing loss. And as I say, for 35 years, I've been using audiometry on an almost daily basis, so I have a very, uh, I have some degree of experience when it comes to the benefits of using audiometry. And, and audiometry do give us lots of benefits. So it's a very useful tool, uh, both clinically and in occupational health, for measuring hearing loss. But as Claire said in her original or uh, her initial presentation, you know, why do we have a health surveillance test? Um, well, firstly, to comply with noise at work regulations, of course. Um, but also, and again, I'm just repeating a lot of what Claire said, uh, but we want to, as early as possible, 
undertake health surveillance tests that will prevent further injury to health. There's no point waiting until um, injury is obvious through a hearing test. We also want to be able to, as quickly as possible, uh, measure the effectiveness of the control process we use. So if the hearing protection isn't working, if, if the individual isn't wearing their hearing protection, we want to be able to demonstrate that as quickly as we can. And I am in complete agreement with Claire, as always. Uh, we want, and I think this is the element that's so often forgotten, we want to use the health surveillance test to motivate that individual to be vigilant in wearing their hearing protection. There's no point doing the best risk assessment in the world. There's no point in providing a perfectly adequate health surveillance test if the person doesn't wear their PPE. So all too often, I think that um, the health surveillance test is considered to be a box ticking exercise, uh, that, that an employer um, or even the individual, once the hearing test is done, results are recorded, box is ticked. Tom's presentation showed us that, that we've created a wonderful, uh, diverse way of innovations uh, to measure, measure and form hearing tests. But I would suggest that the role of health surveillance, or at least the ambition of it, should be much more than that. And I think it's unfair to rely on audiometry to achieve the goals uh, that we talked about. Audiometry, however it's performed, is subjective. It relies on the genuine responses of the individual. Ideally, it should be done in soundproof environments. It's not specific. It measures every element of the auditory pathway from the fleshy outer ear to the brain and all stations in between. And it's not sensitive in highlighting those early changes in cochlear performance. OEEs, again, they're good at um, preventing possible injury to the cochlea at the earliest stages. So before we can measure hearing loss on an audiogram, we can demonstrate there's been changes in cochlear function. Therefore, we can take a proactive instead of reactive approach to hearing conservation and look at the control processes in a timely manner. But also, it's an ideal tool when presented in an easily understandable format to motivate individuals into um, embracing those hearing conservation measures. I don't think, as I say, we can we can rely on audiometry to fulfil those goals. I think it's it's unfair or unreasonable to put the responsibility on audiometry on a test that cannot achieve these goals through no fault of its own or, or the people that undertake it, because it cannot uh, fulfill its ambition to demonstrate a proactive way to prevent hearing loss. Because once it shows hearing loss, it's too late. There's nothing we can do about it. So this is just to demonstrate a, a, a case study. This young man, 27 year old male, came to see us with unilateral hearing loss following a history of uh, exposure to a single noise event. He had left lateralizing tinnitus, but because he was seen by a number of uh, clinicians, but because he had no obvious noise induced hearing loss, he was told that his tinnitus was idiopathic that it was coincidental and had nothing to do with that exposure to noise. So for a long time, he couldn't understand why he was getting tinnitus in the same ear that was exposed to the noise. We then undertook audiometry, uh, sorry, we then undertook OEs after audiometry. And we could then very clearly demonstrate that actually, 
there had been an insult to cochlear integrity, that audiometry was not sensitive enough to pick up. So he went away knowing that actually there is a reason for my tinnitus. It was because of that exposure uh, and audiograms, and he had numerous ones, weren't enough to give him that information. So again, what is a comprehensive, effective health surveillance? I would say that we need to employ not only PTAs, but audiometry, but also OEs. I think that both complement each other. Uh, we do not want to get rid of PTAs, but to rely on them as a sole measurement of hearing loss. We don't want to measure hearing loss, we want to prevent hearing loss. So we use OEEs uh, to give us that early indication, early indicator or leading indicator of damaging exposure, because audiometry will only give us an idea of hearing loss once it's too late. Now, of course, we don't have to, we can carry on doing what we've always done. But I think as Henry Ford said, carry on doing what you've always done and you'll always get what you've always got, which is noise-induced hearing loss. Thank you. I hope that gives you some information on, on why I'm passionate about implementing other technologies to better prevent the hearing loss that we find ourselves exposed to. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, and thank you to all of the other speakers today. Um, we've got a couple of minutes left to do maybe a couple of questions if um, if anybody wants to send any in. So we'll just hang around for a couple of moments to see if any come through. Uh, we've got one here. Um, are there any scientific papers or literatures for OAE or any standards? Absolutely. Yeah, there's a plethora. If you look online, Google OEEs and uh, noise induced hearing loss, you'll find thousands of them. Um, I know when Claire and I worked together when she was in the HSC, I know you pulled together lots of papers that supported this. Um, so, yes, there are standards. There are no uh, standards on um, OEEs per se, although there's lots of data becoming available, which gives us a um, what we would expect appropriate levels of OEEs to be in various age groups. But at the moment, um, there isn't any agreed standards across across uh, all the countries. Thank you. We've got no other questions coming in um, just yet, so we'll give it an, another minute. Yeah, just on that point while we're waiting for any more, um, you can still hear me. Um, I'll, I'll try and dig out that useful reference list that we put together, Rob, and, and if anybody's interested, I could circulate that with the, with the recording of the webinar. Um, and we did start to put together a how health surveillance would fit um how oaes would fit in a health surveillance program and some guidance for the kind of um flags for for providers if they were undertaking oee so yeah a 10 percent drop or a 10 percent change or uh you know, something like that as a warning level similar to we have for audiometry it would need to be piloted um further but it's something we could you know under the uh, hca banner um you put together and, and maybe get some practitioners involved in in testing and piloting if there was an interest and opportunity to do that i think yeah i mean beyond that we we have standards ourselves as clinicians we use our own levels and and, and criteria for what we would then refer on or then suggest other additional test procedures so so part of the program would be doing baseline audiometry baseline oes and then OEEs as the longitudinal measurement of cochlear performance. If then the, the, the amplitude of OEEs drops by an agreed amount, you could then look at retesting with audiometry to see if a hearing loss had become present. Uh, the BSA, British Society of Audiology, are very near to publishing guidelines on using autoacoustic emissions. 
uh, and they have also commented on the suitability of OEEs as a longitudinal measurement of noise exposure and the damage that it causes. Um, so there is there is uh, information and resources out there to support the use of OEEs if, if you want to take that forward. Thank you. Yeah, we've got nothing uh, nothing new coming through just yet. Oh, there we go. We've got, um, is there anywhere where, um, well, from the BOHS side or the, the HSE side, where um, the guidelines on OHEs are published that you know of? No, as I say, the BSA will be publishing uh, guidelines on use of OAEs. Um, I know the HSE were looking at documents, but they didn't actually finalise any documents on on publishing uh, publishing the use of, of OEEs. No, there's a couple of reports, research reports on the usefulness, looking at the repeatability and reliability of the test. Um, again, I can put references to the uh, research reports um, if anybody's interested in looking at those. Yeah. I think from an audi audi audiological point of view, there's no ambiguity that that in a clinic we wouldn't rely on uh, audiometry purely as a, a demonstrator of hearing. And certainly for exposure to noise, we would want to know that the underlying um, hair cell function. And, and it, I started off, the reason I started using OEEs is because I had a group of individuals coming into clinic they all had the same history of noise exposure. Half of them, and they all had tinnitus. Half of them had the typical noise-induced 4K, 6K dip on an audiogram, and half of them had, had relatively normal audiometry. And so the ones with normal audiometry were told that their, their, their condition was idiopathic, and the ones with the uh, 4K dip were told, well, you've got noise-induced hearing loss and therefore noise-induced tinnitus. But it was very obvious to me that they had the same history, they had the same condition. There was something else hidden, something else that was going on that audiometry wasn't able to, to show us. And that's when I started using OAEs as a, as a more sensitive indicator of exposure. And that's 20, 20 odd years ago, 25 years ago. Well, that takes us just, um, just over the hour. Um, if there's nothing else for anybody to add. Um, if you do have any further questions, you can email marketing at bohs.org, and that will come through to me, and then I can put your questions to the panellists or to any of the email addresses that you've seen today. So I will say thank you again to Alex, to Claire, Rob, and Tom for your presentations today. Like Alex mentioned, we've got another webinar uh, two weeks uh, on a Thursday from two till three again. So hopefully we see some, if not all of you there, and we'll be emailing out uh, the recording of the webinar uh, later today or early tomorrow morning. So thank you, everyone, and um, we'll see you uh, at the next one. Thank you, Lee. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.